In the words of the legendary chef and my personal hero, Anthony Bourdain, food is everything we are. It's an extension of a nationalist feeling, ethnic feeling, your personal history, your province, your region, your tribe, your grandma. It's inseparable from those from the get-go. Welcome to Every Dish, A Story, a podcast about a place of food in our lives and what it meant to our ancestors. I'm your host, Kat, and I'm going to take you to a new location every two weeks to connect to who we are. Gloriously rich and sweet, with just the right amount of acidity, this soup defies the modest reputation of its main ingredient. However, when the dish was first invented, it was simply a case of the alum being in the right place at the right time. I'm of course talking about soup à l'oignon, the French onion soup. Welcome to the third episode of Every Dish's Story. I'm your host Kat, and today we're going to France. A little disclaimer before we start. This episode will contain a lot of French words and a lot of French names that I'm not really good at pronouncing. I researched uh, as much as I could, but if I mispronounce something, please cut me some slack and bear with me. I mean, no offense to anybody. Okay, now let's start. French onion soup, or as the French call it, soup à l'oignon, is a kind of soup that is typically made with meat, stock, and onions, and is sometimes served au gratin, meaning browned with croutons or a larger piece of bread covered with cheese that is floating on top of the broth. Despite its ancient origins, the dish saw a rebirth in popularity in the 1960s in the United States as a result of a growing interest in French cuisine during that time period. Most likely thanks to Julia Child, who brought the French cuisine to America, and it's her recipe that I'm going to be using in my video. So check that out. Served as a meal in and of itself, French onion soup can also be served as a starter dish. Soups made with onions are nothing new and have been popular since at least the Roman era. Because onions were plentiful and easy to grow, they have long been regarded as a food for the poor throughout history. Originally from Paris, France in the 18th century, the modern version of the soup is made with beef broth and caramelized onions and is served hot. When André Mouquin opened his New York restaurant in 1861, his wife, Marie-Julie Grandjean Mouquin, served as a chef. This was the first time the dish was served in the United States. It is frequently finished by being placed in a ramekin under a salamander grill and topped with croutons and comté or gruyere cheese that has been melted. The crouton on top is reminiscent of ancient soups. Now let's give the credit to the onion. The onion is a vegetable. It is difficult to imagine a more readily available, versatile, and affordable ingredient. Onions, despite their distinctive flavors, have a modest appearance and don't often get the spotlight. Well, enter French onion soup, a hearty soup that finally gives the humble onion a chance to shine. Onion soups have been around in Europe since the time of the ancient Romans and Greeks. Due to their general abundance, onions were regarded as a poor person's food in medieval recipes, and they were bulked out into a soup by cooking them in water. Allium was a natural choice for soup because it was thought to have restorative properties at the time. For centuries, the onion was stereotyped in this way until a fateful night in France in the 18th century changed everything. According to one legend, King Louis XV was hosting a party in his hunting lodge when he became hungry and raided the pantry, where he discovered butter, champagne, of course, and a handful of onions. Naturally, the king set about putting these seemingly insignificant ingredients together to create the first classic French onion soup. A well-made French onion soup defies the Allium's wallflower status by being sweet yet tangy, savory yet silkily rich. With a foundation of beef stock, white wine and caramelized onions, all it takes is a smidgen of calvados or cognac to elevate this dish to royal status. Not to mention the piece de resistance, a golden crown of crisp crouton smothered in a melted, gloriously stringy layer of Comte au Gruyère cheese. Is it just my mouth that is watering already? All right, let's continue. <laughs> French onion soup, an incomparably wonderful and soothing dish of chopped onions and beef broth, toasted bread, and grated and grilled Comte au Gruyère cheese is a national treasure. Its gastronomic roots lie in the broths of ancient Rome, made for the first time around 8,000 years ago. The formula dished out in restaurants across Paris and in the kitchens of lovers of French cuisine everywhere, including mine, took shape in the 18th century. 
and there are two contrasting theories or myths concerning the creation of the modern French onion soup, both of which concern King Louis XV and his extended family. As I mentioned earlier, the first one goes that after a long day of hunting for deer with his court, the king returned to his lodge to find the cupboards practically bare. All that he and his great aunt, who was staying there at the time, could find were onions, butter and champagne. In a matter of 21st century students around the world, they threw the lot in the pot, stirred and served, thus creating a new and marvelous treat. According to another legend, onion soup originated in the kitchen of La Pomme d'Or in Chalon and Champagne. Nicolas Appert, the father of food preservation and inventor of canning, was working at the hotel one night when the Duke of Lorraine, ex-king of Poland, Stanislas Leszczynski, stopped on his way to Versailles to see his daughter Queen Marie, Louis XV's wife. The Duke was so taken aback by the soup Appert had prepared for him that he had to leave his chambers in his bathroom, descend to the kitchen and fight back stinging tears while watching the chef dice dozens of onions and learn the exact method of preparation of his new favorite dish. He was apparently set on taking the recipe to court and surprising his daughter and son-in-law with his culinary prowess. Aper actually dedicates his onion soup à la Stanislas to the royal in his cookbook, which was published in 1831. It's unclear whether the Duke ever made the soup himself at Versailles, but it was quickly adopted by the court. Aside from its hearty flavor, they discovered that it was also quite effective at masking the odor of a long night of drinking. It quickly earned the moniker Drunkard Soup, and it remains the go-to hangover remedy in many French households today. Whatever version of the story is more accurate, we now have something positive to associate with Louis XV, who historians consider to be one of his dynasty's weakest and the most ineffective monarchs, a man who quote-unquote left state affairs to ministers while indulging in his hobbies of hunting and womanizing. He knew a good soup when he tasted it, though. If you ever attend a wedding in France, don't be surprised if someone offers you a bowl of French onion soup after the cake has been served. Why? Well, because onion soup has long been thought to be a hangover cure, the French equivalent of the 2 a.m. pizza slice or a falafel wrap. It's a custom that may have originated in the ancestor of the world's largest food market, which is located in Paris. King Philippe Auguste founded the market known as Le Halle in 1135. It began as a small open-air food market, but it quickly grew to the point where a wall was needed to separate it from its neighbor, the Song in the Song Cemetery. The cemetery, however, began to devolve into the grotesque as the market grew and expanded. It became so filthy that it was rumored to be blessed with magical, quote-unquote, flesh-eating soil, which caused bodies buried there to decay in a matter of weeks. By the early 19th century, the city was forced to relocate the bones of the cemetery to the catacombs, leaving space for the market to develop into what novelist Emile Zola would call the belly of Paris. Le Halle attracted people from all walks of life. Not just professionals, such as wholesale goods vendors and purchases for the thriving restaurant and grocery industries, but also poorest residents of Paris, who were drawn to what Philippe Melo calls an immense pantry in his book La Vie Secrète des Halles de Paris. That was a mouthful. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> the poorest of the poor ate arlequins, which were plates sold by servants that were filled with leftovers from large banquets and got their name from their multicolored appearance, just like harlequins due to appetizers, main courses, and desserts all being served in one plate. Those with a little more cash could go to the outdoor soup vendors, which Emile Zola depicts so vividly in his novel The Valley of Paris. At one corner of the foot pavement, a large circle of customers clustered round a vendor of cabbage soup. The bright tin cauldron, full of broth, was steaming over a little low stove, through the holes of which came the pale glow of the embers. From a napkin-lined basket, the woman took some thin slices of bread and dropped them into yellow cups. Then, with a ladle, she filled the cups with liquor. While warming, the soup was often watery and owed its rich color and appearance to the addition of carrots, caramel, or even burnt onions, long a staple of France's poor soups. In reality, onion soup predates both Louis and Stanislas by centuries. A recipe for thinly sliced onions cooked in butter and topped with pea puree or water can be found in Taiwan 14th century cookbook Yonde. Regardless of where the original recipe came from, the soup certainly rose to prominence in the restaurants surrounding Le Halle, such as Poulet Pot and Pied de Cochon, thanks to the addition of one key element, the gratin. 
These restaurateurs created the classic French onion soup, a dish that transcended class distinctions by adding a heavy dose of grated cheese and placing the bowls under the broiler. The soup became a hangover cure for well-off partygoers living Paris cabarets and drawn to the city's only truly nocturnal neighborhood. There was a special ambience at Le Hall at the time, says José Dufour, the manager of Pied de Cochon. There were butchers working in their white aprons covered in blood, and then there were people who just come from an evening out, women in evening gowns and gentlemen in tuxedos. As a result, there was a gradual influx of people from all walks of life. This neighborhood today no longer has a nightlife. In the 1970s, Le Hall Market was relocated from Paris to Rongy, near Orly Airport, and this part of Paris gradually became just like any other. Restaurants that used to open at sunset and close at sunrise began to serve meals during the day. The Pied de Cochon was one of the first to do so and is now one of the few 24-hour restaurants in Paris. Despite the loss of its nocturnal nature, the Pied de Cochon star dish remains French onion soup. This is the dish that has never left our menu, says Dufour, who adds that the restaurant still sells anywhere from 150 to 200 bowls per day to a diverse group of customers. You have the more festive clients, uh, those who come in as they live in nightclubs or even before they go out. But you also have people who work at night and who come here at the end of their shift, says Dufour. People who work in hospitals, police, people who work for the rail company. And of course, there are tourists. The Pied de Cochon has become something of a tourist destination, attracting visitors from all over the world who are eager to sample the simple concoction of slowly caramelized onions, rich beef broth, day-old bread croutons, and a hearty portion of Gruyere cheese. Customers at the restaurant aren't the only ones who enjoy the soup. Uh, Pied de Cochon has also worked with its neighbor, Song Eustache Church, for the past 10 years to provide its famous dish to the neighborhood's poor. The day of the soup, as we call it, is a meal that's always served on the second Sunday of January, explains Gerard Sibel, president of La Soupe Saint Eustache. Everyone gathers in the church for a meal, and Pied de Cochon prepares onion soup for 400 people, sometimes even more. In the modern neighborhood, Le Hall, as they were, are noticeable. The only indication that the covered market once existed is the name of the metro station. Onion soup, however, remains as a relic of the past, despite or maybe because of its simplicity. You can't put it in a social category, says Dufour. If you're one of the haves or one of the have-nots, soup is for everybody. And it's on this note that I'd like to end our little excursion into friends and Billy of Paris and all the difficult words. And once again, I apologize for butchering the beautiful language. I tried so hard, I literally gave myself a headache. <laughs> and I refer you to the YouTube channel. Uh, the video should be up by now. And I actually made the broth myself, as I said before. Uh, and I strongly advise that you do the same. I know the temptation of using the very fast and cheap and um, store-bought stock, but... But trust me, you do want to make the broth yourself because it just elevates it that much higher. Please like, comment, subscribe and click on the notification bell. And uh, also follow me on Instagram at Cheddar Cats and subscribe to the podcast. Give us a rating. i leave all the links down below in the description. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, on any of these platforms, you can message me, you can leave me a comment about dishes that you'd like to learn about in the future. And I'd also love to hear if you have some personal anecdotes or family stories to share, something that is uh, related to certain dishes. I would absolutely love that. And again, thank you so much for listening. Eat well, train hard, love cats, and also please recycle your garbage. Bye-bye for now, and I'll be back on October 14th with a new journey.